Mel may be boring, but his guests aren't. It's Al's Boring Podcast. Oh, hi, it's Al Dukes here, and I have a new podcast, and this is uh, episode one. And I'm going to interview uh, various people in the media, radio, TV, bloggers, podcasters, that sort of thing, and kind of find out uh, all about them and where they got to where they are today. And my first guest is Evan Roberts. He works here at WFAN. Hi, Evan. I'm honored that I am in episode one. You were my very first one, and I thought you'd be a good one. One Thank of the you. dumb names I was going to come up with to call this was going to be um, communication major. Mm. Because I think that's a terrible name. It is a terrible name. Yeah. But as I was thinking of that, I thought that you got started so young, you were perhaps not a communications major <laughs> because maybe you didn't even go to college. That's a fair assessment, and you're accurate, yes. You did not. I did not. So, well, let me ask you this. I took two years of community college classes while working, yes. and I got an associate's degree. That now, counts. That does count. Okay, so I went to school. Yeah, you went to, you got an associate's. Yes, I have an associate's degree from a community college in Maryland. So where were you growing up as a child? I was growing up in Woodmere, Long Island, uh, right near John F. Kennedy Airport. A very quick commute to Shea Stadium, because I basically grew up at Shea Stadium. My dad would take me all the time. In fact, there were stories that even as an infant, I was at Shea Stadium. So... um As a kid, then, you're into what? You're into sports more, or you're into radio and television, or you saw yourself more as a sports guy as a kid, or a media person? You know, my dream as a kid, and it's no longer my dream, was to be the radio play-by-play announcer for the New York Mets. I wanted Bob Murphy and Gary Cohen's job. Uh, It did not work out well for me, but that's my interest in radio, and my interest in the Mets, and The Mets were on this radio station, so at a very young age, I was actually listening to this radio station. I was listening to Mike and the Mad Dog. I even listened to Beningo. I don't bring it up to him much anymore because I could tell he felt uncomfortable when I would say I was listening to you in the overnight. He'd be like, bro, you're making me feel old here. So I don't tell him that much anymore, but I started listening to the radio station, loving baseball, which is the first love sports-wise, and then the other sports kind of came after. So it was radio and baseball were my two loves. And and what did you do? Did you used to do play-by-play in your backyard? That's right. That's right. People thought I was talking to myself. Right. I would play baseball as like a six-year-old, and I would broadcast it as it was happening. Sometimes, I think eventually, like at age nine or ten, I would lower the Met game on the TV. I didn't really like Fran Healy's broadcast much anyway, so I figured let me do it instead. And I would broadcast, and then I started imitating the radio station because I loved it. So I would host my fake WFAN show in my bedroom. And how old are you at this point? Like seven, eight, nine, ten, like and, in that range. And how old are you today? I am thirty-one years old. You're thirty-one today. So <laughs> yes. when you are okay, so when you're a kid, you're doing fake baseball games, yes. play by play. Yes. You're doing fake talk shows. That's right. And what what drew you to these talk shows on on FAN? Um, I think it it started my love for the Mets, and since the Mets were on the radio station, and then my love for sports, and just hearing people talk about sports because I would talk to my dad about sports. We would do our own radio show basically because I would ask him a million questions. So whenever I would get home from school, I put the station on. I'd hear Mike and the Mad Dog. I heard, uh, I remember I used to like Steve Levy back in the day as well. Steve Levy, I think, is on like SportsCenter now. And Howie Rose was awesome. I mean, how, Howie was the best. And Steve Summers, when I couldn't fall asleep at night, Captain Midnight. So I would just listen to the radio station because I love sports and hear these guys talking about it. And they certainly knew a hell of a lot more than I did. So I was kind of learning about sports through the station. And then when did you think... I want to do this as a as a thing, and then when, what do you do to do that? Right away, I always knew I wanted to do it, and I remember telling my parents that I wanted to work at the fan. So they said, well, then, you know, you should do something about it. So I decided to make a tape, which I remember doing on my own, and it was terrible. On cassette? On cassette. I'll make a tape and then send it to the fan. And obviously my parents helped me out with sending it because I, I don't know how to mail anything. Do you know who you sent it to? Oh, you know, I sent it to Chernoff. He was here. He was the, I, I'll never forget so this. what year is this? Oh, man, I was about nine, so 92, 93. I think he had first started. And I'll never forget this. There's a lot of memories as a kid I don't remember. Like, my parents will tell me this happened and I don't remember it. Like, I don't even remember that much of my fan experience here, but I remember getting a phone call back that my parents said, my dad said, you got to listen to this phone message. And I was like, who the heck is he? Who's it going to be? And it was Chernoff saying, I got your tape. It's pretty good. Maybe we'll put you on the I Miss show. 
And little did I say, that was the one show I did not listen to because it wasn't sports. Nothing right. against Ibis. I mean, I knew who he was, but like I was into sports and I'm nine. I wasn't listening to Ibis. So I remember being all excited about that. And that's when they gave me a one shot deal to fill in at nine years old. And obviously it's like a stupid little gimmicky thing for to have a kid right. fill in and it uh, kind of, I guess that is right there, the beginning of my radio career. So at nine, you send the tape, and do you yes. know what you put on this tape? I s- vaguely remember recording it in my parents' room. Were and- you doing an impression of Mike and the Mad Dog, or no, were you doing you, your I, own show? I think I did a sports update, and I think I did like a little bit of a show. I think that's how I did it. Like, I was really imitating John Minko when you talk about who was I imitating, because I was doing a sports update. Because I think at the age of nine, I kind of understood. I, the way I thought about it was, look, Evan, you're not getting a talk show. Right. You're nine, but maybe you'll get to do updates. Right, you get two minutes here, two minutes there. There you go. I was reasonable. So I was really imitating the Mink Man, and that's the tape uh, they heard. I... I don't remember much about what I specifically said on it. I just remember it vaguely being an update. What about what was in the, your parents wrote this letter to Chernoff? No, I wrote it. I absolutely wrote you it. You hand wrote it or do you see a little typewriter? I type definitely hand wrote it. Yeah, I didn't know how to type. Okay, so you send it off to Chernoff. He calls you back and leaves a message on your actual cassette <laughs> machine. <laughs> yes. That says, uh, Imus would like to put you on. Yes. That and was did, the and did you know who Imus was? I knew who he was, but I didn't listen that much. You know, as a kid, you wake up. I wasn't listening to the radio as much, but I definitely knew who he was. And was yes. your dad an Imus fan? My dad, <laughs> you, you want some honesty? My dad was a Stern fan. Right. But he lied, but he respected Imus. I don't think this was like a, oh, I can't have my son go on Imus. Right. But... No, he was he was excited. You know, his son's going to get a chance to be on Imus, so it was because very exciting. In those years, if you liked Howard Stern, you hated every other thing on the radio. Exactly, because everything else was a ripoff. It absolutely you were ripping I, off Howard. I, right. I think my dad was able to take a step back and say, "My kid's having a chance to be on this show. I like Imus. He's great." And when your parents tell you, "Look, Imus is interested in putting you on," are you excited to go on or you're nervous? Uh, or both? I was. At the time, I was more excited about getting a day off from school because I knew I had to take a day off from school. So my first thought was, yes, I'm going to get to miss a day of class. And then as it got closer, I started to get a little bit more nervous. And my the biggest part of being nervous, as I remember it, and again, there's a lot of things I don't remember about filling in on Imus, but there are moments I do remember. And one of the moments I remember is walking into the Kaufman Astoria studio during this long hallway it's like a dungeon and being incredibly nervous. Now I have no idea what I'm doing. So I remember that feel of being nervous as I was walking into the Kaufman Astoria studio. And did your parents take photos of you this day? Do you have pictures of you doing the I, Imus the show? The only photo I have or I've seen is a photo of me and Imus, who, by the way, I will say, was incredibly nice to me that day. I met with him, and this is the other thing I remember. I don't remember even doing the updates. I don't remember what I said. I don't remember if it was good. I don't remember if it was... T- I don't remember anything. But I remember meeting him after the show, and he was giving me life advice and career advice, and there is a picture of me and him shaking each other's hands. He was not smiling in the picture. See, if this was happening today, you'd have video of you and I'm I you know. doing the update. It kind of stinks. <laughs> I know. I, I grew up uh, 20 years too early. So then you get that thing, and you're done for the day with Imus. That's it. And that's it. That was my only time on uh, WFAN for uh, a while. And does uh, he? do you uh, then begin to pester Chernoff and say, hey, that was great. I want to come on and do another thing? The only thing I remember ever doing... I, I don't think I ever spoke to the fan or Mark until I was about to go to college because I was about to go to college. And I remember at that time, you know, I got a contact here. I mean, the guy probably doesn't remember me, but I have a contact and I would start to send him tapes continuously for years. All in your house, though? No, at this point, I'm about to go to college. But where are you recording these oh, tapes? Oh, the first tape I sent him is when I uh, was doing another radio show at XM Satellite in Washington. Like when, Now I feel like, oh, I'm kind of a professional, sort of. They had, there was like 12 subscribers. And I said to myself, it would probably be behoove me to send tapes to turn off consistently because I'd like to eventually get back to the radio station. Well, we made a large jump. You we were, did. I'm you, sorry. You were a child. You, asked, Do, you, you jumped ahead. Yes, it's your fault. You were a child. You did an update for Imus. You left. Yes. It was great. Yes. Great experience, but nothing came of it. You're well, nine so, or ten. Something did come of it. And this is where the, the radio career became very strange, but really helped me in a lot of ways. Uh, somebody was listening, and they basically wanted to pay for me to do a kid's sports talk show, which I did. They call your house and say, hey, we heard you were on IMIS. I think the way they did it, and, and this is foggy, is they called an agent, and the agent contacted me. Tracked so, you down. Yeah, so I think it was like a something like that, and I did a sports talk show on Long Island 
for about a year or so. On a local station. Very local, no listeners, no callers, but it was invaluable because I got experience doing a radio show as a 12-year-old, and that led to something else. What that led to was there was a radio network that played music. It was like a music kid station nationally around the country. And they decided, wow, we should hire this kid to do a talk show. We don't have any talk shows. It was so this called, was like a Radio Disney before Radio Disney. Ironic you say that. It, exactly. It was actually called Radio Oz, and it was before Disney. I think Disney ended up putting it out of business because it's Disney. So it was like a very, it seemed like it was religious, <laughs> and they only, only played music. But they had this idea of let's have a kid talk show. So I did a talk show out of my bedroom. Now I'm at age like... 14, 15. So now I'm like a little bit more awkward than I already was. Even more awkward than I am today. So I did a show out of my bedroom for, I I don't even remember how long it was, maybe for a couple of years. So you're in high school at this point? Yeah, like like late middle school, early high school, yeah. Now, do kids think that's cool that you're doing a show? Do they know you're doing a show? Interesting question. In middle school, I was a big loser. What a geek. In high school, I became a little bit more, oh, that's pretty cool. I, I guess it changes with age. Right. So you do what type of topics were you covering on this? It was sports talk. It was a little bit of sports. It was mostly kind of like the way I w- at this point I am now a huge Howard Stern fan. That's who I'm growing up listening to. So my idea is I'm basically doing Howard Stern, but it's a little cleaner and it's for kids. Right. I know that sounds strange, but, but that's you feel like you're emulating was. him on the on this kid talk show. That's kind of the way it felt to me. I'm basically Howard, and a few times I got reprimanded from this radio Oz because I, I went too far. I think one time I said, oh, God, and that was offensive because I said God and I used the name in vain. I remember they were very conservative. If and you and how are you filling this time? You've got a co-host or are you doing this by yourself? I, th- uh, I think I did it by myself. I'm trying to remember. Are you getting maybe, phone calls? We got phone calls. There were actually a lot of listeners to this. But Oz you network. learned it. Now, did someone teach you like this is how you set up a premise? This is how you set up a topic? This at, is how you generate phone calls? At this point, I knew nothing. And I was learning on the fly. I didn't really have a radio teacher that had come into my life yet. Eventually I would. But at that point, I was just figuring it out. And I can't imagine listening back to those shows because they must be just brutal. Do you have them anyway? You know, my mom and dad save a lot of things. And I bet you they do have some. But I've never asked. Radio Oz. Yeah, I bet you they have some. Some. I don't know if everything, but I bet you there's something there. So you're doing Radio Oz. I'm not giving it to you. You're not going to get to hear the tapes. And now this year is what? What year are we at with Radio Oz? I'm probably like 15 years old now. So that's 19 what? Uh, 98. It's Al's Boring Podcast. Welcome to Play It, a new podcast network featuring radio and TV personalities talking business, sports, tech, entertainment, and more. Play it at play.it. It's Al's Boring Podcast with Al Dukes. When and how do you get to do your cameo in Howard Stern's private part since you're such a huge Howard fan? Well, it all connects. And you're emulating Howard on Radio <laughs> Oz. Exactly. It all connects. I think early on at Radio Oz, uh, they, they were going to create this private parts movie. And I basically said, I'm going to go try to be Howard Stern. So I remember auditioning. There were open auditions open in the auditions New York area? In New York City. And I went to audition as Howard as a kid. You and wanted to the, be a little, How- like, oh, absolutely. A little Howard in the movie. I, I walked in with a wig. I told all the lady producers to take their clothes off. I really tried to... And you were not an actor before that? No, no. I had done no acting. So this is like a new experience for me. Now, your parents were into this when you're like, I'm going to go, I want to be in the Howard Stern movie. They were very supportive, yeah. They were good. They were supportive of it. There was never like, what the, What are you doing? Nor did they force me one way or the other. So they were very good. And I remember, remember the scene in the movie with the puppets? Yeah, you know, doing each other. Doing the puppet show. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I did that in my audition. I did not get the job, but they gave me the job as Howard Stern's friend. Right. I, I like to tell myself it's because I didn't look like Howard Stern. Or maybe you I just did not look like actor. Howard Stern, right. Right. So you wouldn't, if I got the Howard part, you would have been like, this is ridiculous. This kid doesn't look like Howard. I would have thought that, yeah. Okay. So they did a good job casting. Yeah, they did a good job casting. So you have a very strange part in that movie. That is true. Like crazy language, uh, which of course is not coming out of your mouth. You're an actor. I'm an actor, Al. Now, how often, because you, when you, when I see it now Mm -hmm. and I know it's you, it looks like you. Yes. It looks like a little kid, Evan. (laughs) Yes. So how often do different people nowadays recognize you from that? I, I don't know how many people recognize me, but I, I've always, 
it's not like I talk about it on the air, but right. I don't hide from it. I'm very proud of it. It was it was a cool experience. You right. know, if Carton brings it up on the air, I'm not like, oh, don't talk about that. Right. I don't care. So I think based on the fact that it's been talked about, whether it's on the morning show or just casually mentioned, I think people know I'm in it. I don't know how many people would recognize me. In fact, a few months ago, I saw that it was going to be on TV. And I'm with my girlfriend at that time, probably about five or six months. She has no idea. Never brought it up. So I said, we should see this movie. It's a really good movie. She says, okay. So we're sitting on the couch watching this movie. And as the scene comes on, I kind of look at her face to see if she recognizes it. And you can see the slow, like, wait a second. Connecting of the dots. (laughs) Connecting. And she did pick up on it. So I I don't know if a lot of other people do by recognizing me. Yeah. But um, it it was a lot of fun. I got to meet Howard, which was really cool. Really? Yeah. And uh, did you tell him that you were you as a child emulated him on Radio Oz? <laughs> I didn't get the opportunity. I met him in a bathroom at the satellite radio. No, I met well. I met him twice in a bathroom. Once in satellite radio. The other one was when we filmed the movie. And I just remember saying, "I'm in your movie," and he's like, "Oh, great, good luck." Like he was very nice, but it was a quick conversation. I didn't have a chance to to really kiss his rear end. And your parents were cool with you loving Howard Stern at that age? Yeah, Because you were a kid. My dad was a big fan of Howard at the time. He isn't anymore, but he was a fan at the time, so it made it a lot easier. Because That's that how was, I got introduced to him. That was that that was the hardcore nasty Howard years. Yes. Like yes. he was angry yes. and uh he would go in on people. Yes. That I, was during like uh Rodney King, uh LA riots. Yeah. He was I, one thing I remember, I remember listening to Howard in the car with my parents. And I remember my mom sitting there, and what a great observation. She says, he's going to get divorced. And my really? dad's like, why would you say that? And she's like, I can tell. I'm a woman. I can tell. And that was like six months before he announced his divorce. Right. And I remember saying, damn, that women intuition, that's pretty good. So going back, you're at Radio Oz. You're yes. doing this show. And then and what is your next move past that? Well, you're still in high school now. Yes. To show you sometimes this business is all about luck. The guy who would come to my house to set up the ISDN line was a man who, four years later, became a top executive at the now-launching XM Satellite Radio. His name was? Dan Turner is his name. So if you're listening, Dan, who's probably a big fan of your uh, podcast or whatever you want to call it, how you doing? So Radio Oz, it was a national uh, program. Yes. They were setting up a... A makeshift studio in your home. Yes. So this guy comes there to do that. Just a tech guy. Right. Sets up the equipment. Really nice guy. That was it. And Radio Oz eventually just goes under. You know, Radio Disney, I think, put it out of business. I think Disney, like, kind of, you know, big company, the whole thing, shebang. So I'm done, which is fine. I'm 16. I'm 17. Now I'm enjoying high school. I'm thinking about college. I know I want to get into radio. I'm about to go to Seton Hall. Uh, that's the school I was going so go to go to. You're going to go work at WSOU? Exactly. That was part of the reason why I was drawn in. Even though it was a music station, I was like, well, they've got a good talk radio, th- or good radio station, I should say, and I just wasn't smart enough to get into Fordham, which is where all the everybody else goes. As long as you had a radio station, though, you were in. That was it, yeah. My grades weren't exactly up to par to get into a great school. I kind of, I only did well in subjects I cared about, so. All right, so you're in uh, high school. You're preparing to possibly go to Seton Hall. That's right. You're not on the radio now at all. No radio. And then what happens? What happened was about three months before I was going to graduate, this guy, Dan Turner, who is now at this launching XM radio, approached me, approached my family, I guess, and said, we're launching XM. I remember Evan being a a good talk show host. I'd like to pitch him. Can can you get me an updated tape? And I was like, oh, that that sounds kind of cool. Didn't think much of it. So I made a new tape of me doing something. Solo. Solo. Sent it to him. All of a sudden, a few weeks later, I get a phone call from XM Radio saying, we want you to come down to Washington, D.C. We want to interview you. We, we think we may want to offer you a gig around here. But you'd have to give up college. Can't go to college. Right. So I remember my, my parents were split on it. It was going to be my decision, but they were split. I'm trying to remember which one was on which camp. I think my dad said, go do it. My mom was like, go to college. Or so maybe and vice versa. But so you'd I, have to move to D.C. Washington, yeah. And you're going to do a show by yourself. Yes. So I went down to D.C., got the tour of these magnificent facilities, and they flat out offered me a job with a decent starting salary for a kid that's not even going to go to college. And I remember I said, let me think about it. I went home. I talked about it with my dad, talked about it with my mom. And finally, I was like, I got to do it. And I'm going to be so far ahead because I'm going to have a radio job, even if this isn't my entire life. I'm going to have a radio job at the age of 17. I'm not 18 yet. So I said, I got to do it. It makes no, what am I going to do in college? And one of the things I miss told me when I was a kid was communications, majoring in communications is overrated. Learn how to write, learn how to speak properly, major in English, something like that. So I was like, what am I going to do in college? I'm going to go to college. I'm going to work on this music radio station. I have no interest in music. I don't know where it's going to 
lead me, so why not jump ahead and do a talk show? At least I can get some reps and learn how to really host a good show or try. Now, where were they putting you on? Uh, XM Radio. Um, like what channel? Yeah, there was a channel they were going to gear to 15 to 25-year-olds, so a little bit more advanced than radio. I was but kind of like a young talk station. And that's the channel they were going to put me on, and I, I agreed to it. I said, I got to do it. So I accepted it, and right, I think I had to leave high school early by a couple of weeks, and luckily it wasn't a big deal, and I started in June of my senior year of high school. And you and you moved down there to live with who? At first, I lived in a dorm, because during the summer in Washington, there are so many interns like all over, the ca- over Capitol Hill, so I stayed at American University for about a month and a half, just to see if I like it. I mean, who knows? Maybe three weeks in, I'm like, this is a mistake. I right. can still always go to college. Eventually, I ended up getting my own apartment in August uh, in Maryland, and I live by myself. So this show you go down there to do, you're hired to do, mm-hmm. and you haven't done a show since Radio Oz. Correct. And this is going to be a daily show. It's going to be a daily show. Monday to Friday. Monday to Friday. How, uh, how many hours a day? Three, uh, three hours. Three hours a day by yourself? By myself. Are you panicked at this point? What am I doing? I'm excited. I'm like, this is a great opportunity, and that's where I really started to learn how to do radio. My boss at the time basically taught me all those things you mentioned earlier. Which was who? Uh, Kevin Straley was the guy. I'm not sure where he is now. Are you familiar with him? I I, I, I interviewed uh, down there. Oh, okay. uh, Probably in the late 90s. Okay. Very late 90s, but he was uh, he was a guy that I had interviewed with. Great guy. With. Yeah. Great guy. And a brilliant radio guy. I give him, he's like the number one guy I give credit to as far as learning all the intricacies. And where is he now? I'm not, you know, I talked to him a few years ago and I forget where he was. I'm not exactly sure when Sirius and XM had their merger, if you will. I think he stayed on for a little bit and then went elsewhere. So I'm not sure. I know he was from Massachusetts, so he's probably back up there. But So he, he basically was, was teaching you how to do talk, how to yeah. set up topics. Yeah, I think he must have seen potential in me and said, now i got to teach him how to do the basic things, how to tease, how to take calls, how to drive calls, especially when we don't have listeners. I mean, this is all from the beginning, so you're going to have to drive how to get listeners. So he was, he was great. And sometimes he was hard on me, but it turned out to be great. And were there other guys that started down there and talk that – are successful guys now? Um, like who were like other guys that were on your station that you? No, that not really. It was a, it was a. Yeah. I, I don't think it worked. Yeah, <laughs> I don't think it worked for anybody else. And what was the name of the channel? It's called Babble On. Babble On, which I always thought was really lame. I didn't like the name. And did you find it a struggle to get through these three-hour shows every day? You know, it was easy. What we ended up doing is bringing in college kids, so I could have like. Not co-hosts, but guys to or gals to kind of have throw ideas off of. So it turned out to be a pretty good idea. So we'd have like two college girls and a college guy, and it made it easier just kind of getting topics and having the conversation go based off these freshman experiences at college. So it turned out to be valuable. I made friends that way, and uh, that turned out to be a great way to kind of keep the show moving without callers. And you do that for how long? This uh, show? Two, three years, something like that. A couple then, of years. And then what happens? Uh, Laid us all off. <laughs> the, uh, why is that? XM, I guess, had spent way too much, and they cut a lot of channels, and we just happened to be one of them. So the entire channel was cut, everybody lost their jobs, and it was traumatic because now I'm 2021. I had this steady job. Now it's like, okay, what do I do? Is it too late to like go to college, right. or should I look for another job? And I spent a year unemployed collecting unemployment checks. My parents gave me, which was very helpful. My parents said, look, we're never going to let you be on the street, but you got to figure it out. Well, you know, we're not, we're not going to hand you all this money. you got to figure it out. Best experience ever because it taught me the value of a dollar. Very smart move by them. Not to the point where I was going to be homeless, but to the point of, okay, you're unemployed. Go figure it out. And I figured it out by saving money really well and sending out billions of tapes. I and, sent out tapes everywhere. And you were figuring it out still living in D.C. or you come back up here? Living in D.C., taking some in the classes. Dorm, or you had an apartment? Had an apartment. Had a living girlfriend, basically, even though she was just, uh, I don't want to get into that. She was crazy. What a, what an idiot I was staying with this girl. I think she cheated on me a bunch of times. I cheated on her. It was a mess. It was just horrible. Or are you unemployed at the time? She <laughs> I'm was, unemployed. She was looking elsewhere. Exactly. And I know nothing. I mean, I know nothing about women now. I knew less than that at about 1920. So it's kind of living with her. Took some classes at community colleges, which my parents- Communications? Uh, no, nothing. Just stuff I wanted to learn. Just to get an associate's degree. So I took a lot of politics and American history, and I spent time in libraries reading. I kind of, that was my college. Edu- I self educated myself on what I cared about the presidents. That's oh, how right. I learned them. You are an expert at presidents. I am. And how far into this unemployment are you like, well, this, that, that run is over as far as doing this for a living? Uh, I never gave up. 
I never gave up because I kept sending tapes out, and sometimes I'd get responses that were like, oh, you're a finalist. Yeah, we'll consider you for this job in Portland. I was offered a job in Portland. I'll never forget that. For, like, minimum wage, you're going to cut tape. Maybe you'll get an on-air shift. And I had to make the decision, am I going to do it? And I, I held out. I decided not to take it, thinking maybe something better will come along. And something did, because eventually I got a show in Baltimore and was able to do not a full-time gig, but a lot of part-time shows on the uh, ESPN station in Baltimore. So that was that so, was something. So your Babel On show, that channel, yes. that was uh, sports or that was kind of everything? It was mostly Guys. everything. Guy There's talk. a lot of guy talk, and then uh, I would veer off and do a little bit more sports. So when you're when you're unemployed and you're sending tapes, has the, has the sports radio explosion happened? Like, are there sports stations now all over the country? There are sports stations everywhere, and it was weird because... For a few months, I was deciding, do I want to do a sports show or do I want to do this kind of guy talk type of thing? And at first, I was thinking about both. And then a few months in, I said, I got to do sports. I got to do I I don't know if I was, I didn't really love the show I was doing. I enjoyed doing it, but I didn't think I was that good at it. I didn't think it was that good of a show. So I was like, maybe I'm better off kind of really focusing on sports. And that's where most of the demos I would send out to, including here at the fan. They didn't hire me. Was was Mark Chernoff working here when you became unemployed? Yes, so did you immediately send to him, right? I was sending him tapes before that. and he, Even while I was working, I sent him. And is he getting back to you at the time? Always got back to me, but it wasn't positive. It was <laughs> well, like, oh, just keep working on it. You know, good luck. He just said, you're not ready yet. Yeah, pretty I mean, in so many words. In so many words. I had an agent at the time, so my agent would also reach out, and I think most of the conversations would be with her so that I didn't have to hear point blank how terrible I was. So then what's this part-time job you get in, in Washington? Uh, Baltimore Sports Talk Radio. It was a show like on weekends and fill in work. And then they said, oh, you have a chance to do mornings. Like potentially I'd get the morning show and it just, it never materialized. While that happened, I started to get in contact with Sirius and they were interested in hiring me to do the guy talk thing, not the sports. And they were talking about building some type of channel around the shock jocks. And I guess I'd be some young guy learning along the, the way. Young shock jock. Yeah, even now, though I, I don't think I was a shock jock, but whatever. And Howard's there at this point yet or not, not yet? Not yet, no. Nobody's there at that point. Right. I was in touch with Sirius and Jeremy Coleman, who I'm sure you're familiar with, for like a year. And for a year, he told me he wanted to hire me. For a year. But nothing came about. And I would, every month on Q, I'd write this guy. What's going on? What's going on? What's going on? Finally, like about a month and a half before Howard signed, they offered me a job. Now, are Opie and Anthony there at the time? Uh, Opie and Anthony had signed oh, right, XM. with XM, XM like a little bit before that, if my memory is correct. I think they had signed with XM, yeah, like probably a few months, maybe a year beforehand. But XM, I never really had a chance to get back there. There was just nothing going on now, there. Now, would you have been willing to go to Portland, go to... Uh, yes. Sort of these random cities Yes, at the time. I was willing to do it. I wasn't sure I was going to do it for that specific job. If I was offered like a show to do, I think I would have done it. At the time, that the offer just, I was like, you know what, I'm better off just continuing to look. And it worked out because I got something in Baltimore at least. Okay, so you're in the Baltimore area. You have that part-time job. Yes. And then what happens? Uh, that's when Sirius offers me a full-time gig. So the, you send, you're sending them tapes. The, I'm sending them tapes. They're sports tapes. N- it's sports and guy talk because I still have the show from XM. And so you're, you're still doing this one by yourself? Still doing this one by myself while sending tapes to the fan. And it, it must have been within days of each other. Sirius offers me a job. And the fan, I, and I'll never forget, this was the message I got about what uh, Chernoff said to my agent. He's not terrible. <laughs> And I was like, oh, that's oh, so sweet. That was really sweet. I almost <laughs> cried. And he's like, you know what? I'm going to bring him in. You know, maybe we'll do some updates with him. So I was like, holy crap, this is finally all happening. I'm going to get a full time gig at Sirius. And I got at least a, at least I'm getting into an update over Right. Studio. Right. So when I came in, I remember I worked with the Mink Man and uh, Chernoff listened to my update tapes and said they were awful. He said, I, you know, I think they're bad. But. I have more hope in you in a talk show. I think you've got the potential to do a talk show, so I'm going to give you a shot. I'm going to give you a shot from 4 a.m. to 6 a.m. on July 17th, 2004. Now, do you have the serious job at this point? I have it agreed to, but my start date wasn't for like another month. Okay, so he gives you a 4 a.m. to 6 a.m. slot. On July, never forget the date, July 17th, 2004. I just turned 21 years old. And that's on a weekend? It's a Saturday and a Sunday Okay, at 4 a.m. Do you remember who you came on after? Of course. Who was that? Tony Page. Tony Page. And before that was Adam Shine. And Adam was very nice to me because I got there so ridiculous. I got there like at 10 o'clock at night. And the show was at 4 a.m. 
Because I was nervous. I wanted to yes. make sure I was prepared. And I remember Shine was like very, you know, I remember my first show. Really? You'll be fine. Yeah, I'll be fine. He doesn't know me from a hole in the wall. It could have been terrible. Who the hell does he know? But he was very nice. Tony was very nice. And I was incredibly nervous. And I got through two hours. Okay, so then that ends. Chernoff has the tape. Yeah, and he says, he actually emailed me like an hour after the show was over. So like 6.30 in the morning on he a Sunday morning. He does listen at very strange hours. Yeah, he does. I give him credit. And he said, you know, again, it wasn't bad. Not terrible. Well, maybe we'll give you another shift down the road. So now I'm like, this is great. At that point, I'm telling Sirius, look, here's the deal. I'm signing with you. I'm working here. But you got to always let me fill in at the fan. It has to be a must. You can't block me. And they agreed you got it. That's a part of your deal. You can fill in at the fan, which was turned out to be very valuable because within a year, they created a rule over there that you could not fill in or do things if you're full-time on any other radio network. And I remember when they announced that rule, I went to them and said, you know you're keeping this for me. And they're like, yeah, yeah, you're fine. You're fine. So what show do you start doing at Sirius? I do a nighttime show, Guy Talk, from about 6 to 10. On four what hour show, uh, Maxim Radio. So the Maxim Magazine launches a, a radio channel yes. on Sirius, and yes. that you're doing by yourself, or you have a guy with you? I brought one of the guys. I told you earlier at XM, I, we would have these college students come in. One of them worked his ass off. He was great, and he would help me out. We became friends, and I remember I told him during the unemployed days, I'm going to get a job, and if it's a guy talk type of show, I'm, I'm bringing you with me because you worked your butt off, you're good. I, I want you. And that was one thing I asked Sirius for. I said, you got to bring this guy, Brian, with me. I want him. You got to bring him here. So he became my co-host. And uh, we worked very well together. We lived together, too, which made it, you know, I wanted to kill him after about six months. Can't live with somebody and work with them. Right. It's a lot of hours Unless together. you're sleeping with each other. That's the only way it can work. And we were not sleeping with each other. So so you do that that show for how long? Uh, a couple of years, two and a half years, maybe two and a half years. You're, Something like that. You're consistently filling in now at Fan, also. It started to become consistent. In a, I forget at what point, but they started having me do a lot of overnights. I think there was a lot of uh, fluctuation going on in the overnight. So it, it happened quick. I, I went from doing one show to one show a month to all of a sudden I was doing almost, I think there was one week I did five shows in a week. So I did six to 10 at night and then one to five 30 in the morning. And it wasn't staying up. That was difficult. It was watching the games. It was being informed. I'm doing a radio show between 6 to 10. How am I watching anything? So it took a lot of reading and a lot of faking, <laughs> a lot of faking to actually sound prepared for those shows. And what, were, what was the difference between the two shows that you're doing at the same time? Uh, night and day. I mean, the language first. Not that I, I wasn't a cursor on Sirius, but the topics could go a certain way. You could be more direct with what you're saying in regards to women and drinking and all that type of stuff. You know, at the fan, I'm not touching any of that, especially as a, you know, my first go around doing overnights and obviously the topics, you know, doing a hardcore sports show as compared to like everything else. So, and then also not confusing where you are with the phone numbers. I think I right. gave the maximum number on the fan a few times. And did you ever do anything during those early times at the fan where when you were done with the show, you were like, ooh, the, I, I possibly Chernoff's not going to like that? Uh, nothing from a, like a standpoint of I went too far. Just, I hope this is good. I hope this sounds good because... I, I, I work my butt off to be prepared. I still, to this day, I try to watch everything I can. I DVR games, the whole thing. And I want to be prepared. It, it was impossible to do that. It was impossible because I'm doing another show. So that was really the thing that was was, was so difficult is how the heck am I going to sound halfway intelligent? I'm not seeing half of these games, and people can see right through that. So that was what made it so difficult to get through those shows. And what eventually happened is they offered me two overnights on a permanent basis. Monday morning and Friday morning. And it was the best thing because now Monday morning I'm going to be prepared because I'm not doing a show Sunday night. I'm watching football all day. I'm watching baseball if it's during the summer. So the Monday show would be the easiest thing to do. The Friday show is a little bit more difficult, but I, I felt much more in a rhythm when it was consistent. So and that became consistent Monday morning, Friday morning. So I basically had two jobs in a way, the weekly serious show and then the Monday and the Friday fan show. And does the weekly serious show go away or, or you get more work at fan so you, you quit that job? Uh, I was starting to get more work at the fan. Like I was filling in. I actually filled in with Joe. First time I ever met him. We did a show together filling in for Mike and Chris on one of the, I think Memorial Day we did a show. So I had to take off from Sirius. I was using all my vacation days and then I just started to not like doing the show I was doing at Maxim. I just what about like your partner? It. Uh, Did he, he sense it? you were you were parting ways with oh, him? Oh no, he knew. He knew that the handwriting was on the wall. I didn't like, you know, what the channel was. It was becoming 
they started to play more music on the channel. It was a talk show with occasional music. Then it was becoming like too much music. And I, I just wasn't interested in that. And I started to realize I want to do sports. And even if it's not full time at the fan, I now I think with doing these shows at the fan, I can get a job. I now have a better resume where I can go to St. Louis and do a talk show. So I started to really not like my job. And I knew that summer of 2006, I was done. And this is true. What put me over the edge was the Met run. Because the Mets are on this run. They're about to go to the playoffs. And I got a night show. I'm not going to go to any of these playoff games. And I said to my dad, I'm miserable at my job. I can't live with myself if I'm going to miss potentially a championship run for a job I don't love. So he's like, so you're going to quit? And I was like, yeah. (laughs) He's like, you're going to quit for the Mets? I said, it's not for the Mets. It's that's putting it over the edge. That, you don't believe me. You're giving me a look like I quit for the Mets. I like it. That shows good passion. <laughs> good Mets passion. But it re- I swear, it, it, it was the final nail. That's all it was. I wasn't happy there. I knew I was going to quit. And it was like, let me do this now so at least I can enjoy a run. I've saved money. And then hopefully something happens with Fan. If not, I'll, I'll just go somewhere else and work. I'll try to get another job somewhere else. I wasn't overly concerned about it. It's Al's Boring Podcast. Welcome to Play It, a new podcast network featuring radio and TV personalities talking business, sports, tech, entertainment, and more. Play it at play.it. It's Al's Boring Podcast with Al Dukes. Okay, so then you quit that job. I quit the job. You quit Max. Done. You're working part-time at FAN. Just working my two shows a week. And how long do you do just the two shows for? Well, I, I, after I quit, I called up. I remember this awkward conversation I had with Turnoff or Spitz. I can't remember which one. Eric Spitz and Mark Turnoff, where I was like, hey, just wanted to let you know that I've quit my serious show. They're like, oh, okay. And I said, so I quit. So, like, if I'm available. Right. <laughs> I'm available. If there's anything else, I'm available. And they're just like, oh, okay, that's fine. And then I, like a month later, like October or November, they told me without telling me, we're going to offer you something, but we we can't tell you what it is. But how do you, but I would imagine there's not a lot of movement in the full-time shows at FAN, ever. Yeah, I never really expected there to be. It was more like, let me let them know that I've quit and I may go to another city. I mean, you know, I had no problem doing that. I don't care what city it was, because now I felt like I had more of a resume from Sirius and from the FAN where I can get another show. Like, I wasn't as concerned as I was a few years earlier when I was unemployed. So I didn't expect to get offered a full-time gig. I just wanted them to know that, hey, if you do it, I'm going to accept it. And luckily, at that time, Beningo was solo. And I on no, the overnight? Uh, no, on the midday. Oh, he was midday. Yeah, he was doing midday. I think part of the overnight opportunity I had is that Joe moved to middays with Sid. And Sid had some issues at the time. So Chris Carlin, who was now the overnight guy, started filling in on Imus. So it created a lot of openings in the overnight, which is what created the opportunity to, as I've told Sid, his issues gave me a chance to do overnights. So right. thank you, Sid. He knows that. So I tell him that. So at the time, I think Joe was solo, and I didn't know they were going to put me with him. I had no idea. I'd done a show with him. So I, I, I had done a few, like, filling in from Mike's. Not a, Mike and Chris. Not a lot, but a few. And they offered me that gig in December of 2006 to do the show with Joe, and I was stunned. I had no idea I was going to get that opportunity. So you never did overnights full-time here? Uh, no, my... Full-time was sharing it with Tony Page, where I did Monday, Friday, he did Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, so, so they, it wasn't full-time. They offer you the 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 midday, then that's the job you have now. That's, that's the job the I have now. Job. Yeah. Yeah. January of 07, I started. Really? Yes. Wow. Well, I, did you? Are you surprised? Yeah, well, I didn't... I, I didn't what year re- did you think I started? Oh, I did, I'm, not, I'm not sure. That doesn't... Um, hmm. I didn't know that kind of was uh, a hand-in-hand with the Boomer and Carton uh, starting. It was very similar, because you guys started similar September months. 07, right? Yeah. Yeah, and I started January of 07. So it was very, yeah, it was very, very close. And did you, did it feel weird doing a show with someone having done all those years by yourself? Uh, well, was, you did the serious show with the, another fella. Yeah, but the, the difference was the serious show with the fella, I was clearly just leading the show and he was a co-host. Here I looked at it the other way. Like this, the way I looked at it was, this is Joe's show, okay? I'm just going to follow along and do the best I can. So uh, at first, that's the way I kind of looked at it. Now. You know, hopefully we'll get a rhythm and have chemistry. But what helped is that he, Joe was like the nicest guy to me at first, which is strange because now I know Joe and he always says this. He'll say it on the air. He doesn't like men at first. Okay. Women, he'll give you the benefit of the doubt. The man though, he's not going to give you the benefit of the doubt. And I think there were two reasons why Joe liked me at first. 
our teams were very similar from a football baseball standpoint. Basketball and hockey wasn't that big of a deal. I'm a Jet fan. I'm a Met fan. So right there, he liked me. And B, right out of the gate, we were talking about women. I was having some issue with a girl, and I was like, oh, let me talk to Joe about it. Let's see what he says. And right away, his eyes lit up because he's like, hey, this guy, you know, he actually gets women. Let's talk about this. So I think we bonded over women and the two teams we like, and that made it very, very easy because he was great to get along with right away. And you seem like he w- was welcoming of a partner? Very much so. He came across very welcoming. He led me around, like, my first day to everyone introducing me. This is Ev. He's my new partner. Say hello. This is T-Roy, one of my sons. This is De- to everybody. And I, it was the nicest thing. Like, I was stunned because I didn't know what type of guy Joe was going to be. He could have been like, who the hell is this? Sh- who the hell is this guy? Right. I don't like this kid. So he was, like, the nicest. And that that definitely helped. So good job out of him. So now you're solid there seven years. Uh, is that what it is? Yes. Seven. Will eight, be eight. Nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. This is my eighth year. We're completing our eighth year. Wow. So ninth year begins in January of 2015. Crazy. Now, are you eyeballing Mike's slot when he retires? Not really. Not really. I mean, of course, it's a dream to like do afternoon drive and all that. But let me tell you something. I love the midday show. I mean, think about this. I get up at hours. 7 a.m., 7.30, right? I bike to work. I do a three-hour show, which is, with, you know, with the commercials and all that. It's like nothing. I'm home by 2. So if I'm going to have a kid in the next couple of years, I'm not married or anything. I have a girlfriend, but you know, I'm not trying to predict my life here. But if I'm going to have a family, wouldn't it behoove me and the family to have it while doing this shift? Yes. I mean, think about it. <laughs> I could I could really help the, the wife out. So... Not that I would turn down Mike's show uh, upon his retirement, but you know what I mean. I love the middays. I'm not eyeing anything right now. Do you think you could do a daily five-and-a-half-hour solo show? I don't think it would ever come to that because I think that this radio station loves, during the, these time slots, team shows, which I agree with. I yes. think it's the right strategy. I think it makes the show a lot better. I think the reason Mike's by himself is he's Mike. You know, dog leaves. They're together for a million years. You're not necessarily going to put a replacement in there. So I don't think it would ever come to that. I think... Um, Whoever replaces Mike, whether it's me or anybody else, would probably be two people. Do you think had you be, went the update guy route, mm-hmm. you would be happy being the update guy? Um, Probably not. Probably not. I love doing a talk show. I love doing a talk show. And so, what, is, what is the advice when people come to you, college kids, because you're a young guy mm-hmm. still and have been doing it a long time, what is the advice that you give them? Well, I always tell them, that the most important thing is to do a radio show. It doesn't matter where it is. It doesn't matter how much you got paid. It doesn't get reps by being on the radio. I was fortunate to get to do it at a young age. I'm not even talking about the the kid shows. I'm talking about XM because now I'm an adult, 18, 19, 20, and I'm doing shows. Not making that much money, obviously, and just getting the opportunity to improve yourself. If you look at this radio station, there's examples of all types of stories of how people got here, all right? But Ingo's got a crazy story. He was a listener. I have my story. There is the story of just being an intern. I think that's Craig's story. I mean, the guy was an intern, and we've seen that with Mark Malusis and even a guy like Greg Giannotti. So there isn't one way to be to move up. There's, there isn't. You know, there's a lot of different ways. But to me, it's about getting on the air. Even if it's in a crappy city, even if it's not in New York, get on the air. And then the goal, obviously, is to come back here. So my advice always is get a chance to do shows and don't be turned off by the amount of money or the city that it's in because that'll be the best opportunity to get better at what you do, too. Give me a guy on the air here, a part-time guy, yeah. young guy that you think has star potential. I think John Dostremski can be great. Yeah, he's, I think guy he's already think. very good. Yeah. He's got good energy. I um, About a year ago, I was filling in for your show, Boomer and Carton, and I don't know why the vacation schedule worked out where I was doing it alone. And I was like, you got to be kidding me. I I mean, I don't want to wake up at 6 a.m. and do a show by myself. It's a morning show, you know? So I remember I asked Mark, I said, let me do it with Jastrzemski. Let me do it with him. So obviously, I I wanted to do a show with him, and we had a good time together. And I will take credit for the fact that I started asking him about his love life, and he was seeing a girl. And that day, after I pestered him about it, they officially became boyfriend and girlfriend. So I basically am responsible for John Jastrzemski's relationship. Right. You're welcome, John. Um, what was my last question I had for you? <laughs> Damn, I had a good one, too. Eesh. I don't know who the Met shortstop's going to be this year. No. Oh, I uh, have one for you. Yes. yes. With the... With the um, as a sports show host... Yes. Do you like... Do you think it's easier doing shows when the teams are terrible or when the teams are on a great run or somewhere in the middle? Boy, oh boy. I go back and forth on this because... Look at the football season in 2014. The Jets and Giants are terrible. 
And I think for a good part of the year, it's great for us as talk show hosts because people love to complain. But when you're so bad, you become irrelevant. Just ask the Mets. The Mets are fun in April and May and June to just crush them and ownership and all that. But by the time August comes around, you're just beating a dead horse. So right. I do think that negativity drives talk radio, there's no doubt. But if you're too terrible, you become irrelevant. It's exactly what happened to the Knicks and may happen to the Knicks this year. It's what's happened to the Mets. So I think you almost need a mix. You need to be good enough to be relevant. But the bad moments obviously spark, I think, conversation and more compelling radio, especially when... You know, you're ranting against the team. I think people seem to like that. So you, negativity is good, but not too much negativity or else it just becomes irrelevant. Do you think uh, a good talk show host can get through and do a good quality show without watching the actual games? You watch the highlight package, you read uh, the newspaper he, articles, and you kind of get an opinion. Yes, go with it. Uh, sort of. I think so to a degree. Because I think a lot of the topics that drive talk radio, are, they're not specific moments from a game. I think with football, you got to watch the game. I think with baseball and basketball and hockey, when we talk about it, it's, it is kind of general sometimes. It's a general thing that usually kind of gets people going. So I think with football, you, you, you have to watch the games, I think. I don't know how the heck you, you'd be able to really say much because most people are examining what happened in the game. I think with the other sports, you can get away with it, but... Um, it's probably more difficult, I would assume. And give me a radio guy that you thought, that you think should be a bigger star currently. Not a guy like uh, John who's who's got upside, but a guy who's currently on the air and has been on the air that you thought, that you think, this guy should be a bigger star if he had a I, bigger audience. I don't know if this is a good answer, but I'll tell you a guy I used to listen to on the radio all the time, and I thought he had, like, the greatest radio show ever, and I think he's local now, and that's Tony Kornheiser. I love that guy's radio yes. show back in the day, and I used to listen to it, like, kind of mid-days back when I lived in Washington, which is where he's based out of. I thought he was, it was a great mix of just being funny, of not being too sportsy, of just fantasticness. I love Tony Kornheiser, and I... I guess he had issues with ESPN, so he was out there. I, I think he's local in D.C. now, but I used to listen to him and say, he's the best. I, I love listening to this guy. And so, does that qual- is that a good that answer? That does. That's a great answer. Okay. Uh, how about your boy, uh, Patrick, who used to do a talk show on um, the Cosmo channel? Yes. See, that's the this is the part I don't like about talk radio. What's the problem? That um, it seems to me these days, talk radio is either... Uh, sports talk Mm -hmm. or political talk. Right. And there is very little room now for shows like uh, your friend Patrick did on Cosmo. Yes. Which was uh, kind of a relationship type show. Patrick had an outstanding radio show. And I like Sirius. I respect Sirius. They were idiotic in the way they handled his show because you listened to it. He did a show on Cosmo. Men loved it. Women loved it. It was about relationships. It was about everything. And it was incredibly popular. I know it was incredibly popular. For whatever reason, I guess they don't work out a deal with Cosmo. That's not my business. I don't care. And instead of moving his show to another channel where it can gain in popularity, he's now doing sports. And he does a great job doing sports. I was talking about him today to one of my bosses saying, you better keep an eye on this guy. You'll hire him someday. You may have to calm him down a little bit because he can get a little raunchy, which is great. And maybe we won't like it on regular radio. But the guy's fantastic. He does a great show. So he's great at what he's doing right now. But that show he used to host, that I used to appear on until I was told not to go on it anymore, was outstanding, and I agree with you. And I think he fell into that where they said, uh, we're not going to keep this relationship guy, women-y talk show. We're going to make him do sports. He does a great job doing sports, but you're right. I think Satellite, and the reason I love Satellite when it first came up was it was an opportunity to have channels that you don't normally have. And so I thought they blew an opportunity there. So if you're listening, executives just screwed up. Sorry. And not that we're looking to throw you out of the building, Evan, but if you were thrown out of the building here, would you go for another radio job <laughs> in another market or a sports-related job in the New York market? Uh, boy, that's a good one. That's a good one. Like, this is the question. Are you a radio guy or are you a sports guy? I think I've become a sports radio guy now because it's been so long since I've done... Look, I did the Maxim thing. I'm not saying it was the greatest show in the world, but I thought it was decent at least. I think I can do a show like that. But I think now I've fallen in love with the sports where I would put myself as a sports radio guy, but hopefully I don't have to make that decision anytime soon. <laughs> all right, that's all I got, Evan. That's, uh, that's You now know everything about Evan. Thank you, Evan, for appearing on this podcast that uh, still doesn't have a name, but I'm sure I'll come up with something terrific. Thank you. See you. Goodbye. Goodbye.